My name is Michael Byrne and on behalf of the Newcastle Writers' Festival, I would like to extend our warmest welcome and gratitude to journalist, human rights activist and filmmaker, Beirouz Bushani, and thank him for taking the time to speak with us and, and also for helping us to understand a little bit more about his creative life, his activism, and of course, the experiences that came to shape his award-winning work no friend but the mountains. So thank you and welcome, Beirouz. Yes, yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having me. Pleasure, our pleasure. Beirouz, I'd like to begin, if I can, with that account, uh, your book, which was published back in 2018. And perhaps if we can wind the, back, wind the clock back a little bit further to when you first started keeping a written record of your experiences on Manus Island. Perhaps for those who are still unfamiliar with how exactly you managed to compose this work, can you remind us how you did that and, and even under what conditions you managed to achieve it? Yeah, I think uh, uh, I should mention at least that uh, this book is the, actually the last uh, effort to expose the system in uh, Manus Island. So before that, uh, for two years, I was working as an unknown source. So people didn't know that uh, I'm working because I was working with uh, some of the media. Uh, after two years, when I became sure that I created a network of uh, human rights activists and also the media around myself and I have uh, uh, supporters and I feel safe. Uh, I started to publish uh, my articles and after that uh, I made the movie Choke Up List the last time with uh, Arash Kamali Sarvastani so people can watch that movie in Vimo website. So, and in end, I, uh, I released this book. So, uh, also alongside this, I work with some of the artists and I participated in some artistic projects, such as the work that I did with uh, Hoda Afshar, which is a video installation. It is about 25 minutes. Uh, so all of these works uh, that I did, then I released the book, No Friend But The Mountain. But for years, I was thinking the, to write a book. And so we can say that this book is the uh, result of five years living in a uh, place uh, like uh, Manus prison system. So. For years, I just I was thinking about it, how to write it, and which kind of language should I use. And and what about the actual method that you used, the text messages, the secret files? Yeah, I think that is that is not a serious matter. You know, the media are interested in this kind of thing. They want to look at it in a dramatic way. You know, they um, uh, that I wrote this book on the uh, WhatsApp, and I send it uh, text by text to my translator. So because I didn't feel safe with the authorities, so mm -hmm. anytime they, I, it was possible that I lose my work. So that's why the best way was that I write it down and send it to my translator. So I was sending the text to Munes Mansubi. Uh, Munes was my translator. She translated almost half of my works. And she worked with uh, uh, Omi Tofikyan, and Omi translated the book. So, but uh, in my perspective, it's not a matter, you know, that how I wrote this book and uh, but the media are interested in this and, you know, anything that uh, they 
publish, they mention this and they highlight this, uh, that, oh, this man wrote a book on the WhatsApp and look how he's incredible. But, you know, for me, it's not a serious matter. You know, what is important is that what I said in the book. And, uh, but unfortunately, you know, we cannot control the media. So they work in this way. So yeah. they are interested to make uh, any story superficial. For sure. And then publish it. You mentioned your, your friend and, and translator, Omid. Um, I saw that he, he wrote in his translator's note at the beginning of your book um, that is a book that functions to make readers resist the colonial mindset. And I know that is a, a, a real anchor and a theme for you in this work. Can you ex- explain to the audience a little bit more about that, perhaps how that mindset contributed to your treatment at Manus? Yeah, I think uh, that written, uh, you know, Manus' uh, uh, prison system and Nauru, uh, I mean, the whole this exile policy established on colonialist mm, mentality. And that uh, relate to my experience as a court. And uh, we, as you may know, there is a history of resistance in Kurdistan and a political movement in Kurdistan in the Middle East. So for Kurdish people, I think there is a big knowledge of resistance in Kurdistan. So what I did, I used this uh, knowledge, this resistance knowledge in Kurdistan, and uh, reproduce it in uh, Manus Island in uh, this context. Uh, for example, I think the first thing is that what I learned from uh, Kurdistan resistance is that the Kurdish people always fight for freedom and there is a great knowledge and history about this and we never introduce uh, ourselves as a victim and we replace victim to you know fighting or fighter I use this, but I'm not sure that I was successful or not. Uh, I don't know how people in Australia look at me and how they understand uh, my works. But always I try to don't introduce myself and the refugees as a victim. Uh, I work in a way that people understand that we are resisting in front of the system. And we are fighting to get our freedom. But I'm not sure that I was successful or not. Unfortunately, when you are a refugee and when you are in a place like Manus, people have already had this picture that you are a victim and you are uh, passive and you now have uh, this desire or willing to fight. So I don't know. And, you know, I'm really not happy that uh, some people look at me in this way, look at me as a victim or look at me as a person who wrote this experience, Uh, you know, because that is not true. And that created by the media, they always want to create this picture of me and other refugees in Manus Island that we are victim of of course we are victim under this system but in other side we are not passive we uh, are fighting we are resisting and we have something to share with the society we have something to say Mm. and we have something to contribute to the society and we have political opinion uh, so I'm not sure that I was successful or not. It's really, it is a big, big struggle. And still I have to struggle with that, you know, after six years fighting against the system, 
uh, still I should uh, always introduce myself as a person that, you know, I have been fighting against this system and people, but, uh, you know, always are interested to look at us as a victim, which is not true. Uh, so I learned this, I borrowed this term from uh, Kurdistan resistance. In other side, you know, in the history of Kurdistan, the Kurdish people, I mean, the political movement in Kurdistan is radical. And uh, this uh, uh, political mo movement uh, is not just to make the situation better. You know, the, the Kurdish people always fight and resist to create a new structure and create a big change. So when I started in the, to work in Manus, I didn't want to make the situation better in Manus, you know. Mm. Uh, I wanted to create a big change and get freedom for everyone. So that's why I think it's very related to my experience as a court and to the history of resistance in Kurdistan. In generally, I can't say that I borrow uh, the resistance culture and knowledge in Kurdistan and reproduce it in uh, Manus Island. And you mentioned earlier, Beirut, how you, know, you worked for years um, on, on, on essentially the material and the ideas that, that went into this book. And of course, back in Iran, you were a journalist, you used your publications to draw attention to political causes um, very effectively. Um, I, I wanted to ask uh, to you as a writer, you, you have mentioned in the past, you know, you, you've, you've noted how words have their own special power. And I wondered if you could expand upon that, um, how you think they, they have their own special place as instruments of, of resistance. Yeah, uh, you know, as I, you know, I say that many times, but yeah. it is a key concept in my work and in my critical mind that I always have problem with the language that the media used and the current journalism language. And still I am struggling with that because the media, unfortunately, you know, the, they, uh, they rely on the official sources. They rely on the language that created by the government. And that's why in some ways they are a part of the system. Mm. Uh, you know, they are, it's possible that some of the media, some of the journalists are not aware of that, but generally they are a part of the system. And uh, that's why I, I, I never been happy with uh, and comfortable with the language of the uh, journalism. Of course, I'm a journalist and I, I don't reject journalism at all. I mean the current journalism language. So that's why I had to create my way. I had to uh, find my own language and create my own language to represent the situation. And uh, I get distance from journalism uh, language and try to you know, rely on literature, which is a free language and is a powerful language. But of course, in this book, you can see that, you know, there is a, a journalism language too, in some ways. But in other side, I use the literature language. So this book, I don't say that it is a fiction. I don't say that it is a novel. Uh, I don't say that it is poetry, but this book happened in literature context. And that's why uh, we should, uh, so any approach to this book as a novel or as a poetry, I think 
it is wrong and we don't understand it. We should understand this book uh, as a whole picture. So just literature in this book is only a tools that are used to expose this system. Mm. So we should don't approach this book in a way that we approach other books, other novels. Yeah, we should understand it in this way. And 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 despite you doing that so effectively to expose this system to Australians, do you still feel now addressing us today um, that it's a message you need to still emphasise, a message you need to send, resend to us as Australians? Because I, I guess the brutal truth is, you know, nothing has changed in our politics, that the inhumane policies stay in place. Um, and, and really the majority of Australians endorse those policies because the party that represents those policies is returned to power repeatedly. Do you still you know, feel like actually, that you I, need to get that I, through to us? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I feel shy to ask people to read this book, and I'm not comfortable to say that, read this book, read this book. But in other side, I feel that I should uh, ask people to read this, this book because it is your history and it is a part of uh, Australian history and it is a part of not only history, you know, for now. And people should know, should learn. And you cannot close your eyes and say, I don't want to know. Unfortunately, in Australia right now, that happened. But I am very uh, disappointed with uh, Australian people. And, you know, I am sure if, you know, this book was written in a detention in other countries in Europe or other countries, uh, we could, you know, create a big change. But now that more than 80,000 people or 90,000 people already read this book in Australia, which is a huge number, still nothing happened. And now that uh, because of you know, coronavirus, everyone locked up in their rooms, everyone, you know, are uh, actually experiencing, uh, you know, in some ways, the uh, same thing as the refugees are experiencing. Uh, still, people don't understand the refugees. Right now, there are hundreds innocent people in detention in Australia, and many of them are in indefinite detention, indefinite prison for seven years, eight years, some of them 10 years, and they are innocent, but still, you know, the government doesn't care, and still there is not a big pressure on the government to release these people, you know? And, you know, right now, you are in prison in some ways. You know, and I am in prison too. I'm here. So in New Zealand, uh, people are locked down too. So I think it is the time that people just really think about this. You know, that how people are frustrating because of this situation. And, you know... You are in quarantine just for a few days or a few weeks. But these people have been in the uh, same situation and worse than this for seven years. Can you imagine that you stay in this situation for seven years or eight years? And worse than this, because you can go out sometimes. Uh, but still, people don't care. You know, I read the news that, you know, in UK, they released 300 refugees.
from the tension. Even in a dictatorship system in Iran, they released 100,000 prisoners because of coronavirus. But still, still in Australia, the government keep people in detention. You know, mm. still there are people in Port Mosby, still people are in Nauru, and this government is wasting million dollars just to keep people in indefinite detention, which is not necessary. I don't know why, I don't understand. So I think, unfortunately, it became a part of the Australian culture. Mm. In this country, the, they normalize this to keep innocent people in indefinite detention. Or to, I cannot believe that you in this country they keep people for ten years in indefinite detention. Ten years, you know, for ten years in indefinite detention. And no one complain. And there is not a law in this country to protect these people. So, and even after 10 years, if they release them, if they release them, they cannot go to the court and make complaint and, you know, get some compensation or anything. Still, you know, there is not a law to protect people from mm -hmm. end of this. I wonder no, hearing you say those no, no. words, if 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 more Australians were familiar with you know the indignity of imprisonment and the pain and discomfort of starvation of, of torture, things that you've experienced, whether your message, others' messages, would get through to to us a bit more permanently, I guess. Uh, and and in saying that, I wanted to ask you now that you have a physical freedom that you didn't have on Manus, how, how you, you think Manus changed you, how it, how it changed the sort of contour of your spirit? Actually, your... I'm not free now. I'm in quarantine. Yeah. Sometimes, uh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I feel that, uh, you know, I look at it in, uh, you know, in a surreal way mm. that uh, I was released from that uh, uh, prison that detention and I spread this prison to the world you know <laughs> you know everyone around the world right now are in quarantine yeah. so uh, yeah I'm not free now actually uh, yeah so you know of course you know we're uh, you know, seven years or six years is a long time to change anyone, even in a normal life. So after six years, you are not this uh, person. You you changed. And of course, in a place like Manus, so it was a very unnormal and exceptional uh, situation. And of course, that was a huge experience and that uh, actually changed me and everyone in Manusan and changed Australia, you know. Still, unfortunately, still people of Australia still are, people are not aware that how this policy changed Australia, damaged the refugees, and in other side, changed Australia negatively. Mm. Now, I can see the way the government is treating people in this uh, corona situation is uh, same as the way they were treating the refugees in Manus Island, because they practiced this dictatorship in Manusaina and Nauru for years. And now you are facing the same people. You know, in Australia, lots of people were demanding that the government should close the uh, schools. And, but uh, the government didn't care, you know, it didn't care. 
you know, for years and years, people were demanding Australia to release these people, release us, but they didn't care. And now they don't care about what the Australian people are, you know, asking and demanding, you know. Political culture in Australia changed a lot because of Manu Saina and Naro, because of this exile policy. But unfortunately, still, uh, people don't recognize that uh, during the last year, the terrorist attack that happened in New Zealand, I remember I had this opportunity for a while to watch ABC. And I remember on that time, there was a huge debate, political debate, debate in Australia around this, that why an Australian citizen went to New Zealand and did this horrible terrorist attack. Uh, what he, and everyone blamed the government, everyone were talking about this, you know, but no one mentioned Manu Sailan and Naru. You know, I was watching ABC all time. And there were lots of, uh, you know, debates in the TV. Q&A, another one uh, program was drama. Or lots of programs and lots of uh, experts and, uh, you know, people were there and they speak about this and they talk about this, they talk about uh, hate speech, they talk about uh, politicians, how the politicians did this, uh, they talk about the Muslim community, how the system treat them, they talk about, but no one mentioned Manu Saila and Naru, you know? And uh, that was, I really never forget that. And that how these people don't understand this, that how many times these politicians uh, uh, talk about uh, Manu Sana and Naru and actually did the hate speech many times, many times, many times. And that ended up in that, you know, that someone came to New Zealand and did that horrible thing. I mean, uh, unfortunately, still people in Australia didn't recognize this. Yeah, didn't recognize this. And I think on future, people will know more about this. And um, in the future for you, where you are now, um, a lot of people are probably wondering what your next creative endeavor will look like. I know you are involved in so many creative things, uh, filmmaking, supervising, academic research, more writing, um, classical symphonies. Um, I wonder if you could shed some light, perhaps not now that you're in quarantine, but, but go back to a, a month or so ago before this cloud came over us called Corona, what, what a day in the life of Beirut look like? What, what, is, what is your support network like over there in New Zealand? What, what do you do day to day? Yeah, actually I spend most of time with myself, so, so I enjoy, I didn't have this opportunity to be alone with myself. So that is my life, but generally, uh, you know, right now there is some serious projects, uh, a movie which is uh, on based of my book and my works. So this movie, some Australian companies are working on it. So I'm working with them. Yeah. So hopefully they have planning to complete it on 2000, I think next year. Yeah. And filmed and, in Australia mainly, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. it is a big project. Another project, it is a symphony uh, that was supposed to release on um, November, but because of coronavirus, so they postponed it. Uh, 
uh, which is a symphony about uh, Manus and based off the book too. Uh, there is another project, uh, which is a book that I'm working with a colleague, which is a collection of my articles and some of the researchers respond to these articles. And there are uh, the uh, documentary also and some theater projects. So all of these projects, but you know, I don't look at them as a, my main work, you know, uh, or my own works. Just I'm working with them and I helping them and you know, which is great because they are uh, re. Actually, they are produce new works on base of my works, on base of the materials that I created, which is great and a big achievement. But for me, I don't want to stuck in Manus. I don't want to, you know, for the rest of my life, people know me as a person who was in Manus, you know? So now I'm just... I'm in a new chapter of my life and I want to do experience new thing and write new thing about different things, not about manus. So the, because it is not my identity. I don't want that people look at me in this way, you know, as a witness or victim, this kind of thing. You know, it is not me. And that's why yeah, my um a new way and um, I'm doing my own works so I don't know how long it will take but I'm working on my new book well on behalf of everyone everyone here in Newcastle Beirut we, we wish you all the very best with those pursuits and endeavors um, and and a lot of us will be eagerly awaiting to see what they what they look like uh, and, and look Thank you so much for your time and on behalf of everyone in Newcastle and the Writers' Festival, uh, we hope that we can um, have you involved in a, in a future festival. After yeah, the, thank after you the very virus much. Clears. <laughs> yeah, this virus is really, I don't know, uh, it's huge, huge thing. So hopefully we pass this, you know, yeah. um, in Australia, New Zealand, everywhere, and we get back to a normal life. Yeah, yeah, we're all. We're and all people hoping. understand. Yeah. And people understand that how is hard to be in indefinite detention. Mm. If there's so a I am silver lining to the cloud. I'm speaking about those innocent people who are still in detention. Yeah. And people, you know, this government doesn't care. Thank you again, Beirut. Yeah, thank you. Stay safe and all the best. Yeah, thank you very thank much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.